<laughs> Dr. Heimlich, you're, you're very interested and active in the peace movement. You're very concerned about world peace. And I understand you have a forthcoming trip to China. Very exciting. It's coming up April 26th. It happens to be the same day President Reagan is going to China, so oh. may cross paths. I was in China during World War II as a young doctor. I was a, in the U.S. Navy in a Chinese guerrilla army in northwest China and in Inner Mongolia in the Gobi Desert area. I took care of a Chinese general and his family and his troops and had a clinic I opened for, a, I was just a young man, 23, 24 and I'd see 100 to 200 patients a day. And it was very, of diseases that no one sees anymore, you know? Very exciting. I got out of China in 46. The general who was command in that area withdrew to then Peking, now Beijing. And when Chiang Kai-shek left, he became the commander of all China, nationalist China. His daughter, then 22, in 1949 said, Daddy, it's not right to kill your own people, and convinced him to meet with Mao Zedong, and they ended the Civil War. And I followed this in the newspapers in his career. He became distinguished for this, and his daughter it was a great, typical Chinese manner of settling things in a peaceful manner. And his daughter is revered for what she did. There is a play that runs about her in China. I lost track after he died in 1974, and I read it in the newspapers. I was at the World's Fair a year ago, September, in Knoxville, in the Chinese pavilion, speaking to the director uh, from China, and told him this story. And as I was leaving, he came running after me, and he brought me back, and brought me over to another Chinese who was doing watercolors. And he said, this man lives in the same house in Beijing as General Fu's daughter. And I wrote her a note. And it resulted in her sending me a letter some months later saying, I'm, we remember you well. My father's colleagues remember how you sacrificed yourself as a young doctor for our people, and you will be getting an invitation. And I received an invitation from the Minister of Health and the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. And it's particularly important because I have the concept that China, which is in Chinese, called Zhonghua, which is central country, is always believed it was the central country in civilization, which it really was for 5,000 years. Now it is central between the Soviet Union and the United States. And I intend, I will be meeting with the leaders in China, and I intend to ask them to address the question to the United States and the Soviet Union, why are you heading for this nuclear war? So it will fit in with my peace program as well. And maybe the president's visit to China? And maybe at the same time will have an effect, yes. Uh, there is my program, which I call Computers for Peace. It's very simple, really. We looked into the question, why are the United States and the Soviet Union heading to a nuclear war? Nobody is thinking of that. They're talking about how many missiles and how many warheads. It has nothing to do with it. And the real cause of this war is the same. It's no different from all other wars. It's a matter of economic competition. After every war, the le leading powers or groups of powers have had another war over economic competition. So if we could have economic co cooperation, if we bring our trade up between the United States and the Soviet Union, we will have an interdependence, mutual prosperity, and you're not about to destroy the source of your prosperity. And it happens in our calculations on computers that we can show that the United States and the Soviet Union are potentially the greatest trading partners in all of history. Your congressman, the uh, Republican leader from Peoria, Congressman Bob Michael, has been interested in this, and he is right now trying to schedule an appointment with me, with the president, when it's convenient, and his advisors to bring this to his attention. You see, the Soviet Union is not ready to talk about military equipment and missiles, or political matters, nor are we. But we can talk trade. And you know, a few years ago, people thought I was far out by saying this. In November of 1982, President Reagan lifted the sanctions on grain and lifted the sanctions on pipe layers for the ga natural gas pipeline from Siberia to Europe. And last month, they lifted the sanctions against underwater 
drilling, oil drilling apparatus. And we'll be selling them $40 million worth. So now, no one can say it's immoral or unethical to sell to the Soviet Union. It's darn good business because they pay cash. But there are those who say it strengthens their military machine. It takes money uh, that they would need for the development, or it allows them money that they would normally need for the development, uh, to, for their technical development, to go them that money to go into the arms race. It's exactly the opposite. They are going to be getting ten billion dollars a year from the natural gas they sell to Western Europe starting this year. They can put that into their armaments. They can buy from Japan and Western Europe, or they can buy from us. There are things they want from us that in no way strengthens their economy. And every dollar they spend on buying from us, that's one less dollar for the military. The military, you see, is going to go on no matter what. If they have to starve, or if we have to starve, the way we're going, we're going to create this deficit and this military spending. This is a way we can start a relationship that is non-military, non-political, and has worked in the past. The Marshall Plan after World War II was a most amazing advance for the United States of America and for the world. For the first time, a conqueror, the United States, lent money and supported the economy of the enemy, Japan and Germany and Italy, and built up their economy. We're not about to go to war with them anymore. After World War I, it was the opposite. We destroyed the German economy by reparations. It had to lead to inflation, depression, and that had to go to Hitler in World War II. So this is the way to prevent the war, and it is practical, simple, understandable, and nobody loses. That's the point. It's win-win as against the inevitable lose-lose, because if we go to war, it will be a nuclear war, and this country will be destroyed. We may have 10 million more than they left, and say, therefore, we won. How ridiculous. Uh, you must approach it. Disarmament will not work. All the arms limitation talks in Geneva are nothing but saying, how shall we fight the next war? You can have this many missiles on land, we'll have this many under the water, and so forth. Trade is the way to get around it. You make a very convincing case. Uh, uh, do you have a lot of support nationally for Computers for Peace? I'm pleased to say it's spreading rapidly around the country. We are actually distributing bumper stickers that say, why are the U.S. and USSR heading toward nuclear war? All the campuses I've been going to are developing programs. We have 70, 150 representatives around the country of different groups who are beginning to work on it. And for the first time, actually, on Monday, April 16th, it's coming Monday, at the Illinois Institute of Technology, they're starting a two-day seminar and workshop on computers for peace and how it can bring about peace. So it's beginning to spread. It's understandable. It works. The reason the bumper stickers say, why are the U.S. and USSR heading toward nuclear war, is that I believe that even if my program is not correct, we must disseminate that question. If we can get enough people in this country to insist that the candidates for public office, both President, Congress, and Senate, must answer that question. It will solve the problem, and it will spread around the world. Because I have asked the question of Indira Gandhi at the Vatican, of congressmen, of huge audiences. The answer is a blank. Nobody is thinking of the question that can save this world. And just think of it. We're all going to be destroyed, and we don't even know why. If we start asking the question, then we'll come up with the answer, and not until then.